Hey, and welcome back to our next session. We're delighted to have uh, many of you joining us from across the country and around the world today to uh, celebrate the life of Abraham Lincoln and to understand how his legacy might become part of our learning in our classrooms. Our next session features Harry Rubenstein, who's the chair of the Division of Politics and Reform at Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. You are going to have uh, an amazing experience today as we not only explore some objects, but we explore Lincoln's life, and we do so with, uh, in the company of someone who has spent a lot of time uh, in exploring Lincoln's life and studying these objects as he recently mounted uh, an, an exhibition by the title of this presentation, Abraham Lincoln, An Extraordinary Life. He'll tell you more about the ex exhibit, and we'll study some of the objects, and you'll help us as uh, you guide our way as we explore them today. So first, let me turn to Harry and have him say hello and introduce well, himself. Well, hello, and uh, thank you all for being here. It's a great opportunity to share some of the things that we've learned about not only Abraham Lincoln, but also the Smithsonian Institution and our history and thoughts about it. Um, I see the first slide or image that's on the screen is Abraham Lincoln's hat. This happens to be the first object that the Smithsonian Institution received um, in its Abraham Lincoln collection. Uh, the hat is sort of an interesting piece because, you know, it raises a number of questions about the object itself. Here's a tall hat. Abraham Lincoln, as we all know, is uh, six foot four. He chooses to wear a hat that makes him stand out even more in the crowd, and it says something about his personality. The other thing about the hat is this mourning band that Abraham Lincoln added. Um, it was a mourning band to um, let you know about the death of his son, um, Willie, who died in 1862. But I think he kept it on the hat beyond that to also share in the sacrifice that so many Americans were experiencing and lost during the uh, Civil War. The hat itself um, comes to the Smithsonian Institution in 1867. It was saved and recovered in the uh, Ford Theater booth. Um, the presidential box by the War Department, who then transfers it to the Interior Department, and eventually, a year later, it comes to the Smithsonian Institution. When it arrived, uh, Secretary Henry, who you heard about earlier in his relationship with uh, Abraham Lincoln, Secretary Henry had a personal relationship with Lincoln, both as a scientific advisor and somebody who he met socially in Washington. When they had arrived, Henry ordered everyone on staff to be silent about the hat coming to the Smithsonian. He ordered that it immediately be put into a crate and stored in the Smithsonian basement, where it remained for about 25 years before anyone saw it again. Um, at that time, it was lent to a museum in the 1880s that was mounting a show on the life of Abraham Lincoln. Since then, it's become a treasure of the Smithsonian, um, something that we put out in many of our exhibitions uh, to talk about the history of the nation. And it is, I think, uh, a national treasure now. Uh, Harry, I've, I've heard people refer to you as the keeper of Abraham Lincoln's hat. Are you, do you have the direct responsibility for looking after it? Um, under our, the museum and in the division of politics and reform, the Abraham Lincoln collection or many of the objects in the Abraham uh, Lincoln collection are in our responsibility. So in a sense, you could say I am now the keeper of that. <laughs> Well, um, we will we will tap into your expertise and knowledge as the keeper of this national treasure. We should mention uh, that Harry uh, works uh, here at the National Museum of American History. Um, I recently had an opportunity to, to visit the new exhibit called An Extraordinary Life, and we are, as we mentioned, looking at objects from that exhibit. We're also going to point out to you that every item that we look at today is available in the virtual exhibit hall um, in a printable format, so that you can go back, um, either download them, look at them online, project them in your classroom, or if you need to use paper, you can do so. They're suitable for printing. Um, Harry, you know, I thought it might be interesting uh, before we, we go any further. I know that there the exhibit starts, in fact, maybe I won't give it away, um, with some basic facts that most people know about Abraham Lincoln. It might be interesting to see what people think are the, 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 the facts that they think most people know about Abraham Lincoln. 
So we're going to go ahead and ask people to use the chat box on the left side of the screen and type in a fact that you think everyone knows about Abraham Lincoln. All right, we'll see what some of those things are coming in. We should say that the exhibition begins with pointing out four facts that we felt everyone knew about uh, about Lincoln. All right, uh, we have a lot of people talking about his beard, his hat, <laughs> his assassination, uh, that he was the 16th president. Uh, he freed the slaves. He was honest, born in a log cabin. He preserved the Union. We have someone pointing out he did not always have a beard. I wonder if a lot of people know that. That's not something that, uh, well, I, I guess well, we didn't always have a beard. I guess we he all saw some, sometime <laughs> in life without a beard, yes. But as I see these things flashing across, I notice that we struck both a chord and that many people know lots of things about Abraham Lincoln, that, that he is not a mysterious president. Uh, we've all studied him in our school. He's part of our culture. He appears in movies and television shows. Even in television commercials, I've, I've noticed Abraham Lincoln. He, you know, so his life is just part of, of our national story. And as I see flashing across the list, the four points that we start our exhibit with have all been mentioned by many of you. Um, and those are that he was born in a log cabin, that he became the 16th president of the United States, he freed the slaves and saved the Union, and that he was assassinated at Ford's Theater. This is sort of the outline, the bare bones of his life. What we try to do in the exhibition through objects directly associated with Abraham Lincoln, his family, his associates, was to tell a fuller story, a more personal one, one that reveals not only his life, but how we remember and think of Abraham Lincoln. Great. Now, there are a lot of objects in the exhibition. Um, and of course, as any museum goer knows, you can s often go out of order and, and tell, uh, put the story of the pieces together uh, as you explore the exhibit on your own. And so we thought maybe we would try to do that with you today and, and give people the experience who aren't here in Washington the chance to do that. So let's go ahead and put up some of the images that are available for us all to talk about today. And I'm going to go ahead and put some letters next to each of them which gives us the opportunity uh, to do a little poll. So just look at the images on your screen here for a moment. See which ones catch your eye. And I'm going to go ahead and put up a question and ask you to tell us which one you would like to talk about. So I'll put that question up on the left side of the screen. And you get one vote, but we'll talk about more than one of these objects today. So. What I like should say as you're beginning to make these selections, what we did for this exhibition was look at our Lincoln collection that had been slowly amassed over the last 140 years. And bit by bit, individual objects came to the collection and began to fill out the story of Abraham Lincoln. The other thing that amazed me is that so many of them came with additional stories that gave us a new look at Lincoln, asked us questions either about his time or later times. And for each one of these objects, we asked the simple question about what did this tell us about Abraham Lincoln or his family or the times. Harry, um, we have a lot of interest in item L, which is the dress on the right side of the screen. So. Shall we jump, jump over there? Sure. This is a blue velvet dress belonged to Mary Lincoln. She acquired it for the 1861-62 social uh, season, winter social season in Washington. Um, it came with two bodices. One was a day bodice and the other was an evening bodice. The one you're seeing now is the day bodice. Um, and we believe it was made by uh, her seamstress, uh, Elizabeth Keckley, who was a black seamstress who was hired and became a confidant of Mary Lincoln during her years in the White House. The dress itself comes to us through the Lincoln family. It was given by Mary to her sister 
and it was his, her sister's son who eventually gives it to the Smithsonian Institution. Um, it was acquired for what was beginning to be the First Lady's Collection, one of our most popular exhibitions at the National Museum of American History, and was actually purchased by the curator of that um, collection for the museum. Great. Well, there you go. You know a little bit about the dress. What can you tell us about Mary Todd Lincoln, the person who wore the dress? You know, she's had a long, you know, this was a long and tumultuous relationship the two had. It was a marriage um, and a family very deeply devoted to each other, both with strong personalities. Um, Mary could be explosive at times. Abraham Lincoln could be withdrawn. She came from a genteel family. Lincoln himself came from the frontier. They ha negotiated this, and they were both intently interested in American politics. Mary was well educated and very concerned about the politics of the day. Uh, the dress itself um, was typical of what was expected of a first lady, and it was a very difficult position for her to be in, for the whole Lincoln family to be in, trying to balance off all of the roles of the first family, of creating a dignified office, both to gain the support of local politics and national figures, as well as the international diplomatic community, but not seeming to sort of go overboard and not realize the sacrifice that so many were facing during the Civil War. So like any first family torn in that circumstance, she was both praised for her ability to negotiate that challenge, as well as roundly criticized by her critics. Harry, one of the other objects that got a lot of uh, votes here uh, was the the watch on the bottom. So let's take a look at that. This is one of those objects that I be became more and more interested in as I thought about it. Um, it poses a lot of questions and in some ways changed my attitude towards Abraham Lincoln. We all have read the stories of how Lincoln didn't really care about his appearance. He would wear ill-fitting clothes, would have his hair unkempt. Mary, we know, used to criticize him and try to get him to you know, wear his hat properly, not on the back of his head, but up front. I mean, all of these things. But here is this fine gold watch that Abraham Lincoln acquired while being an attorney in Springfield. And it is the one symbol that all gentlemen would recognize amongst themselves when you pulled out your watch. It's basically a status symbol. It, it's an emblem of your place in society. And Abraham Lincoln clearly decided it was worthwhile investing in a expensive gold watch with fine English works inside. And Harry, while I was visiting the exhibition, I, I took this photo. Um, and it's, it's really amazing. And I, I hope people can appreciate it when they see it in the form of a picture. I mean, this is what Pam was talking about in terms of the role that primary sources can pay, play in our learning, even a photograph of a primary source. The idea that this was sitting in the 16th president's pocket, uh, and uh, it was something he used to watch the passage of time, and we can think about all that happened during his presidency. It's a pretty amazing perspective on the world to look at a watch that he looked at. Oh. Absolutely. And you can, it begins to humanize him. Here he's picking something and investing in something that he knows other people are judging him on. It's, it's not an uncommon experience both in our lives and how we think of things today. I see you have a question up on the screen, which is a question that I asked myself when looking at this watch. Yeah, so what are some objects that work that way that, that um, well, in the case, I guess going back to the idea of it being a status symbol or a sense of um, um, what does it tell about somebody, right? So what are some of the objects that people wear or carry with them or the accessories they have that say something about them today, right? Ab absolutely. And I think uh, we can ask the larger audience to ask, you know, answer the question itself and of in their lives. You know, you buy either another piece of jewelry that demonstrates something or clothing that you wear. It's something that doesn't begin in the 19th century and clearly carries on, I think, to today. 
We have a lot of uh, items coming in here, people talking about anything from handbags to cell phones, a lot of people talking about cell phones, purses, shoes, um, their iPods, <laughs> uh, jewelry, suits, absolutely, sunglasses, you bet. Interesting how many of you are talking about the electronics that we all carry with us. And in a way, a pocket watch of its time was the electronics of its time, too. Oh, absolutely. Great stuff. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Charm bracelets. Okay. But I think that there's a value in looking at these kinds of objects, thinking not only about the time in which they were used, but also trying to see how drawing on your own personal experience in life, how these things continue to operate. It brings you, I think, in some ways closer to the history of, of the nation and these figures that I think everybody's going to keep saying are so mythic, but in a sense are also very real. All right. One of uh, the people in Sylvia's classroom joins us and uh, talks about crowns, as in uh, dental dental work, uh, <laughs> which is absolutely true. Yeah. All right. Let's take a look at uh, at another object. We'll uh, hop back over, and I'll I'll put the chat box over on the side again, so we can make full view of these amazing amazing objects from the uh, exhibition. Um, Harry, do you have a favorite you'd like to chat about? Yes. It's the object where I really began to rethink this exhibition and what we would do and what kinds of stories we would tell. And that's an object that I tended to really doubt before I began thinking about this project. It's the one in the upper left-hand corner. I think that was A. Yep. It's Lincoln's Iron Wedge. Um, if we can get a picture, this is a very unassuming object. It's a iron wedge used for splitting wood. And very faintly on its side are the initials AL. I, having not spent any time looking at this, always dismissed it as you know one of those things in the collection. And there are many things in the Smithsonian collection that are reported to be something that they are not or there isn't very good evidence. Um, Clearly, anybody can carve an A and an L and an iron wedge and call it Abraham Lincoln's and think they have something of, of value. And, and I just dismissed it as that until I began doing the research for this exhibition. When I began the research, and it wasn't very difficult because we had very good records on the wedge, I learned a very different kind of human story. The wedge itself was found in the home of Mentor Graham, just outside of New Salem, Illinois. And um, Mentor Graham was a well-known friend and teacher of Abraham Lincoln's. So finding this there in the 1880s is like finding gold. They went around town and asked people if they knew anything about the wedge. The first person they approached was Mentor Graham's daughter. And she said, oh, this is, yes, I remember this wedge. We used to refer to it as the Lincoln Wedge. Um, and one day while we were doing some work on the house, the wedge fell under the floorboards, and we couldn't find it, and it was lost. But yes, indeed, this is the wedge that Abraham Lincoln gave to my father when he left New Salem to begin his life and career as a lawyer and politician in Springfield. They then go around and they find another individual by the name of John Spears who says, you know, I was in the blacksmith shop the day that Abraham Lincoln came in and asked to have his initials chiseled into the wedge. And when Abraham Lincoln asked the blacksmith to do this, the blacksmith said, I'm sorry, but I'm no scholar. And as a result, Lincoln borrowed the tools himself and chiseled in his own initials. I mean, this is just one of those moments. It's a very human story. It's very personal. It, though, makes an everyday object tell a story once we've known the information. It brings us to a moment that largely is sort of gone and missed, but brings us back to that, that crucial moment in Abraham Lincoln's life. 
course this is the iron wedge of the rail splitter so it has a additional symbolic meaning but it made me really think about trying to tell and what kinds of stories and what we can learn about these objects that are left behind in our collection. Harry, it is a really powerful object, and it is interesting. And uh, Andrew from uh, North Carolina's Division of State Historic Sites is logged in and makes an interesting point. He says, this is a common object, and it's still in use today. This can help make modern Americans make a more personal connection to Lincoln. I've, I've used one that looks just like it. Um, do we know anything about, or do we know much about Lincoln's time? Uh, we have a few students who are logged in who want to know, uh, do we know any information about how good of a rail splitter Lincoln was? According to Lincoln, he wasn't a very good rail splitter. <laughs> and he wasn't interested and really disliked that kind of work. Um, he was on the frontier, and frontier life requires you to do a lot of manual labor. He, of course, loved books, loved debates, loved conversation. Um, while he spent a good deal of his early life doing all the things that other frontier children had to do, tending animals, tending crops, clearing woods, all of those hard labor things. He was really trying to spend his life trying to escape that work. Um, but he also lived in the world where you had to do manual labor. So it's common for everyone who needs some firewood for their stoves or their uh, fireplaces to have a wedge to break up wood. And so definitely something that all, everyone would have needed. Speaking of wood, we have a couple of other objects in the collection that relate to wood or splitting wood. Maybe we can take a look at, uh, at one of them. This is another one that got some votes. People were intrigued by what looks like an ordinary piece of, uh, piece of wood. What can you tell us about this? This is a piece of a larger, what would have been a larger piece of fence rail. Um, and has part, it plays a role in this mythic Lincoln that Lincoln in itself cooperates and helps engineer. Um, there's a great moment of political theater that took place in 1860 when Lincoln was up for the presidential nomination, and this is the state convention before the national convention. There was a question of whether the delegates would be split. And so the Lincoln supporters concoct this idea of they'll go out into the woods, they'll carry in two pieces of fence rail with a banner about Abraham Lincoln as the rail splitter, the symbol of the common man. And they would parade this in the gallery well, when they did this and they march into the hall, the hall erupts into great enthusiasm. Candidate um, and the Prince of Rails and through and throughout um, the 1860 campaign, as I was saying, the Republican headquarters are decorated with rails. He they hold these great political marches and demonstrations where his supporters march carrying wooden axes, carrying signs about being the rail splitting candidate. Um, there's one, one example of just one campaign item that harkens back to his days as the rail splitter. And I think we have a, a close up here uh, of the uh, of the axe here. And you can see that their supporters pasted on some, they made a wooden axe, they pasted on some newspaper print that says, Fear not, old Abe is ours. Um, over the years, we've lost the S on the, on the axe. <laughs> um, there is a, a, a lot of interest. I, I suppose um, it's a common question people have about the value of these objects. Is it something the Smithsonian value monetarily of these objects? Is that something you guys ever think about? How do you answer those questions? Well, we answer those questions by pointing people in other directions. Our real interest is in the historic value. These are documents to tell us something about the time or to help us educate our audiences about what took place. Often the most common pieces are the things that we're most interested in as opposed to the most rare, which can have the most value. But as anybody who has watched the Antiques Roadshow or any of those other shows um, know, this stuff has a large interest in the public and a market value. 
let's go ahead and uh, bring back our poll here and see where people would like to go next. We're going to bring up our choices A through P. So go ahead and let us know where you'd like to go. And I will uh, we'll see what happens here. Looks like uh, overwhelmingly people would like to know about the hands that we see on the top right corner. Maybe you can tell us about this. Sure. In um, 1860, and I think we also have the life mask. We do. A Chicago artist, Leonard Volk, asked Abraham Lincoln if he would allow him to cast both his face and then later, and there, and there is the life mask that he made of Abraham Lincoln's face. And then when Abraham Lincoln received the nomination for president by the Republican Party, Leonard Volk goes down to Springfield, which is where Abraham Lincoln was, and asks him to cast his hands. Um, if we can go back to the hands. You can see that, and it's a little hard, but you can see that the right hand, which is holding this piece of wood, is a little puffier than the left. Um, th his hand, in fact, was swollen from shaking so many hands congratulating him on his nomination. Um, because his hand was swollen, he, it was hard for him to hold it steady in the mold, so the artist asks him if he could hold something while placing his hand. Lincoln goes out to his back porch, cuts off a piece of broomstick, and uh, they use that to support his hand in the mold. The artist keeps the piece of wood and inserts it in his own version of these casts. So to the question that we're receiving, is the is it steel? No, that's the actual wood piece. It's the actual piece of broomstick. Wow. And uh, this is a photo that I took from the exhibition itself, so you can see how you have it positioned. Um, it's also interesting, you've actually, at the exhibition, have a, um, a bar, uh, which is the same uh, width as the broom, as the uh, as the, the wood stick, right? Yes. So people can see how large their hands are to, compared to Abraham Lincoln. Right. Over the years, everyone who's had this or had an opportunity to see this either on exhibit or in our museum storage have always often tried to compare their hands to Abraham Lincoln's. So we made a mold of the hand and allow visitors to see how their hand um, compares to Lincoln's. As you m might expect, someone who is six foot four, having done manual labor much of his early life, he has large hands. <laughs> Um, there's a question about the. They've, so there are some people who've seen uh, Catherine in particular um, has seen another mask of Lincoln after he grew his beard. Um, do you know when that one was made? That was made two months before his death. Um, that was made by Clark Mills. We also have one of those in the exhibition. And if you compare the two masks, you can see the weight in a sense or the years of the Civil War etched on Lincoln's face between the two. Um, his secretary talks about the two masks and compares them as, as here is the young Lincoln full of strength and energy and the latter face um, of Lincoln and the, the, the toll that the presidency had taken on him. Um, there's a question about the process for making a life mask. Um, how was that done? Well, it varies by artist, um, and I'm clearly not the expert on casting faces, but what they would have done in this particular case is the artist would have created a mold or material, and Lincoln would have, in a sense, placed his face in this mold. They would have had straws for his nose, and you can see the manner in which this is done. There would have also been space for his eyes. Mm -hmm. But that the mask would have been applied or the plaster would have been applied on his face. And when it dried, they would have pulled the mask off, which Lincoln recalls as being somewhat painful and uncomfortable. And this is another example, I think, like the, like the watch that you talked about, where this is an object that, I mean, this was created right off the president's own face and hands. This is this is what he looked like. Um, this is a three-dimensional representation. Was this a was this a common thing for people to do? Uh, was this a new thing? It is something that artists of sculptors of the 19th century did do, uh, in 
preparation for larger commissions of works. Uh, at the time, Leonard Volk was planning on doing statues of both Lincoln and Stephen Douglas. We all know about this, the Douglas-Lincoln debates, or Lincoln-Douglas debates. And uh, these were the two principal politicians of their era in Illinois. Volk was planning on a set of sculptures of these, and so he was asking both of these prominent figures whether he could do this. In a sense, it's prior to being able necessarily to have good photographs of people, or it's a way of documenting them before you begin your own sculpture. I should mention that later today, um, David Ward from the National Portrait Gallery will be taking a closer look at some of these masks. And actually, you'll be seeing the two masks that Harry mentioned side by side. So it should be an interesting comparison for us to look at a little bit later. All right. Let's take a look at another one of the images in the collection. This time, I'm going to ask one of our friends from uh, the, the Smithsonian Education Group to touch the screen. And as they touch the screen, there they go. They have brought us to this interesting model. What are we looking at here, Harry? This is Abraham Lincoln's patent model for lifting boats over sandbars. Did you say patent model? It is a patent model. When, in the early days, when you put in for a patent with the U.S. Patent Office, you not only had to submit the graphic drawings and the description, you also had to submit a working model. And this is what Abraham Lincoln submitted. He worked on this model with a neighbor down the hall, uh, down the street from his law office. Um, what you can see and how it would work is that if your boat got stuck, you would lower down these bellows. The bellows would fill up with air, and the idea was it would float higher in the water and go downstream. It's an idea that wasn't totally unique and um, was never put into production. Abraham Lincoln happens to be the only U.S. president that holds a patent. Um, and one of the things I find interesting about not only the patent model and Lincoln's desire to do this, but also what it tells us about Abraham Lincoln. I mean, at different times of his life, he was looking, like other 19th century figures, at the value and the importance of technology and innovation. Um, this was one of the promises of America, was that we were on an industrial revolution, and Lincoln wanted to be part of it and was always fascinated with technology and science throughout his life. It also tells us something about Lincoln as an individual who is not only seeking to invent various solutions to problems that he sees in the world, he's inventing himself. Here is somebody who grows up in the wilderness, no education, no source, outside sources of support. I mean, his family is very poor. His father is a subsistence farmer. His he loses his mother in early life. His stepmother encourages him for education, but had very little of her own. He's seeking a place in this world, and in a sense, he invents himself. So along with being the only president to hold a patent, in a sense, he patented himself. And his figure is so much part of our lives and so much a part of the American promise. And I think that this patent model is just one of those objects that helps symbolize that aspect of his character. It's incredible. You start to look at these objects side by side as we are today. You see uh, a person who was an inventor, a scientist. You see somebody who worked with his hands and carved initials into um, wood splitting wedges. Um, and then you see a president. Um, and we're going to be talking more about his times and life as president throughout this conference as well. It's hard not to have an incredible epiphany, if you hadn't already, about what an amazing person we are. And his, he's a, really a Renaissance man in a lot of ways. Yes, and he took inspiration from the early Renaissance. I mean, he loved those books about the Founding Fathers, their quest for knowledge, and the promise of America. And he really embodies it and takes it very seriously. We have a few questions um, reflecting 
um, uh, Abraham Lincoln's interest in science and technology and, and naval, uh, in this case, uh, this, this patent model, about how that actually um, influenced it, his abilities as commander-in-chief in terms of use of technology. We'll be talking about Lincoln's Air Force tomorrow with Tom Crouch, but do you have anything to offer? Oh, it, it's, it's definitely true that from the earliest, his earliest days, and you know, he trained himself, or and it was Metro Graham who helped uh, teach him how to be a surveyor. So, you know, from his earlier days, he he's interested in science, and that plays a significant role in two ways um, during the Civil War. One is he very much involves himself in the procurement of new technology for the military. He tests rifles and looks at boats and encourages ballooning and all of those things. He also adopts very quickly and he early on becomes very interested in the telegraph and how the telegraph as a new form of communication and technology can be used by him to influence what's going on in the Civil War. So he's uh, an early adapter of, in a sense, new technology, both for military purposes and for communication. And as I mentioned, uh, we will talk more about this uh, tomorrow during Tom Crouch's session. Uh, Tom is a senior curator at the Air and Space Museum. All right. Um, there's some interest here uh, in uh, seeing uh, M and <laughs> in B. So they're about tied. So where shall we go? Well, let's go to M first. I think that I guess it was a narrow. It was a narrow vote, maybe. Yeah. Um, you get the you get the close call tiebreaker. Right. This is Abraham Lincoln's office suit. It's something that he wore during we know the last year of his administration. It's typical of of the clothing of the era. What? I find, and it's hard to do on a screen, and I encourage everyone to come to the museum if they can, to see this, is it really humanizes Lincoln in a different kind of way. It's nothing like seeing the suit of clothes that somebody wore on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the cuffs are, are slightly frayed, so we know that it was something that he wore for a while. And an individual who who knew Lincoln at the time and was was working at the White House as a doorman, refers to the frayed sleeves on this particular garment as demonstrations of Lincoln working hard to save the Union. And that's why the sleeves are frayed, from pardoning soldiers and working on other aspects of the Civil War. Wow. You also get a sense when you see this of really what what it means to have somebody six foot four. <laughs> Earlier, you, when you br uh, showed us the picture of his hat, you talked about a tall person becoming even taller uh, with a uh, wearing a very tall hat. What what is what does that say to you about Abraham Lincoln? I think I mean what it says to me is that someone who is both conscious about their identity and seeking to create. Um, his identity in a very conscious way. It's not someone who is indifferent, but is attracted at things that would, in a sense, help to project what they're seeking, or what he was seeking to show other people. Somebody who wants to stand out in a crowd is clearly one thing that, uh, rather than downplay his height, he is, in a sense, reinforcing his, the fact that he's towering over hmm. other individuals. We have a picture here that appears uh, in the, the book, by the way, also by the same title. Uh, and by um, and you can actually really see, uh, get a sense as he stands there uh, with others, uh, his, his height with and without that hat. Um, all right. Um, how many of those suits did he have, by the way, was one of the questions. Um, we don't know. Um, my sense is that he probably had very little clothing. And we base that only on the fact that after his death, Mary gives various articles of his clothing to other people. And there just isn't a lot of evidence of things surviving beyond we know where the suit is that he wore to Ford's Theater, he wore this as his office suit, and then of course there's the suit he's buried in. 
beyond that, there aren't other pieces of clothing. And I have a feeling that he had very few. The same thing is true about his hats. It's not like somebody who had a large hat collection. You know, it's, it's interesting. We have a, an observation here by one of our uh, participants uh, from uh, Timothy Edwards Middle School who says, you rarely see pictures of him in anything else, especially while he's president. We should keep in mind, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but we didn't have paparazzi and photographers chasing around the president, catching him uh, at every moment. F photographs and illustrations like what we're looking at or photographs that we usually see were sit-down planned opportunities for the most part, weren't they? Right, and it's the limitations of photography of the day. It was very difficult to film was slow. And uh, so people had to stand very still, otherwise you end up with these large blurry figures. There are some people who are working on outdoor photography and historic scenes, but they're using large camera equipment, tripods, things that you don't allow you to turn or run around with. Lincoln, though, loved to be photographed. Um, at key moments of his life, once he had the financial means to be photographed, he would have uh, him, he would go to a photo studio like other people of his time, and at key moments of his life have his portrait taken. You know, Lincoln is always, in a sense, trying to find his place in history, and is very concerned that he won't leave his mark on history. And he does these things and thinks about things to find his place. And photography plays an important role for him in that. There's been a lot of interest, especially on the part of a few people, and I like to make everyone happy, um, <laughs> in uh, learning about the desk, the table um, that's at the lower right corner. Uh, so maybe we'll take a look at that, and then we can uh, spend some time just with some open-ended questions that people might have. Right. Well, we should, though, go back to the one object that everybody, most people said they wanted to know more about, which was the inkstand. But let's yeah. quickly go to the desk, and then we'll do the inkstand. You got it. Um, this is a desk from the Pekin County Courthouse in Illinois. Um, and Lincoln, for much of his law practice, would ride the circuit. And being a circuit lawyer meant that you followed a circuit judge, and a group of them would go from town to town in their area and settle cases as they went. And this is a desk left behind at the, the Pekin Co County Courthouse that Lincoln and his fellow circuit lawyers would have shared at different times. One of the things that's interesting about the desk is that it's recovered by Senator Everett Dirksen from Illinois. He's a Republican senator from Illinois, eventually becomes a uh, minority leader. And he works with Johnson in helping to write much of the civil rights legislation of the era. Um, he takes this home with him, the desk, and it becomes his Lincoln desk. And you can envision Everett Dirksen gaining inspiration as he's working on the civil rights legislation of the 1960s from his Lincoln desk. Hmm. Let's ask people, I'm kind of curious, as you think about objects in, in other people's, in, in, uh, in your life that inspire you, uh, I'm wondering what people might have that inspire them, uh, objects like this in your own life. Feel free to tell us about an object in your life that inspires you, perhaps because of its source or where you, how you came to have it or who had it before you. Anyone have anything in their life that has served a similar function as the desk we just learned about? Go ahead and type it on the screen there. You'll see a box. So we have people saying um, music that they've acquired, um, pets, um, guitars, grandfather's family Bible. We recently had a famous Bible in the news that was used at a large, uh, very uh, well-watched event. And in fact, it was Lincoln's Bible, wasn't it? Yes, it was the, the Bible used at Abraham Lincoln's uh, inauguration. Somebody has a jury box. I find that fascinating. A lot of people talking about books and letters and toys from grandparents. All right, so... Clearly, the legacies we leave behind in the form of objects can influence other people in a lot of ways. Sure, and these are common experiences. They're not just, you know, it, because it's Lincoln, we, you know, put it in a national museum and we can do this. But, but it's something that is shared by, for many of us, that we, we look for objects around us to bring inspiration or meaning to our lives. Uh, 
Lincoln wasn't different in this, and the people who are inspired by Lincoln have the same feelings as well. Great. Um, you mentioned the the ink uh, the inkwell, uh, so maybe we can take a, a a quick look at that, and then we'll see if we have some time for some additional questions. So let's let's hop back over and and uh, maybe you can tell us about what we're looking at here. Sure, this is a simple ink stand, 19th century brass ink stand. What makes it so important is that it sat at the desk uh, in the telegraph War Department telegraph office. Lincoln, almost on a daily basis, would go to the telegraph office and find out what was going on in the war, see how battles were developing. He also used the telegraph office as a means to communicate directly with military figures, um, something that they always or sometimes didn't appreciate. But Lincoln, in a sense, inserted himself, as no former president was able to do as a result of the telegraph. Um, the clerk who desk Lincoln was sitting at was noticing in the summer of 1862 that Abraham Lincoln was working on a significant document. And he became curious and at one point when it seemed like Lincoln was done with what he was working on he asked him what, what he was struggling with or trying to write and Lincoln says I am drafting an order to free the slaves of the South and it's at, the, at his desk in the summer of 1862 that Abraham Lincoln, amongst other places as well, is working on the Emancipation Proclamation. Just one of those you know, items again that brings us in very tangible ways back to a moment that changes the nation. Simple things, everyday things, but that's what sort of surrounds our lives. Yeah. It's pretty amazing too to think about a president visiting a telegraph office on a regular basis and it, it took a while I mean this was new technology mm -hmm. you would have thought they would have put a telegraph office in the White House right away but no they they made him walk down the street this uh, forgive me if this is a silly question but I've seen similar ones so maybe it's not that silly no I'm just kidding um when Lincoln walked to the telegraph office um, I mean we t today we think about national security and um, that we, we think about um, um, secret service agents whereas Lincoln accompanied, do you think, on walks like this to the telegraph office? It wouldn't be surprising. Clearly the kind of security that we now associate with presidents hadn't taken place then. But we were at war and people did realize that he was a target and at times he was a target actually. And uh, so oftentimes he was accompanied by some military officer that would serve as his bodyguard. Fascinating. Well, we um, we have just a few moments to go before we need to wrap up, just about a minute, and then we'll be taking a break for about two hours before our three additional sessions today. So we thought we would just take a few more moments. You've answered a lot of questions already, Harry, but uh, maybe we'll see if uh, people have any remaining questions about any of the objects. So go ahead and let us know um, in the chat box, and we will see if we can address a few of them. Okay. Uh, there is a question here uh, about uh, the use of the inkwells we just looked at and whether that was also used, uh, if, do we know if it was also used by Lincoln to pen letters to uh, the, the mothers, uh, parents of people who were lost in the war? My sense is that Lincoln would use this opportunity when he went to the telegraph office to get some work done. Um, he ref said that he found it easier to work at times in the telegraph office where he wasn't disturbed by all of the people in the White House who were coming asking for jobs or had other pressing needs. So he would use the desk of Major Eckert um, to draft all kinds of, of letters and notes and things such as that a president needs to do. Uh, here's a question uh, from the Durham Museum. Mike asks, did presidents use many pens symbolically like our presidents do today? We've in the news recently seen President Obama signing some of his first executive orders and whatnot, and you'll see him using multiple copies of a pen. Not that I know of. 
I mean, it's a trend that begins when there's these formal bill signing ceremonies in the presidents in which they, you know, and some presidents are very good at this and hand out dozens of pens. Um, other presidents didn't really like to do it and um, wouldn't. But from my knowledge, when Lincoln signed these various things, he, he didn't follow that or didn't start that trend, um, but it was sort of one pen per document. Uh, there's a question about some more detail, a little bit more about the detail on the ink on the inkwell. By the way, uh, what was on the lid of those ink containers? It looks like a phoenix, some sort of mythical bird, or some kind of dragon. It's we have yet to really analyze the, the decorative motifs on this the stand. All right. Um, other questions here about other articles of, of Lincoln's clothing. Um, I know you mentioned we have the suit. Do we have anything else that Lincoln wore? Um, we have a scarf. Um, he was known or a shawl. I mean, he's well known to during the the colder seasons of in Washington. He would often wear a shawl, and we have one of his shawls in our collection. I think that's the only other article of clothing that we have of his. All right. Well, we are going to be taking a break momentarily. But before we do, Harry, um, anything else you'd like to uh, leave people with in terms of what this uh, uh, mounting this ex exhibition has, um, has taught you about Abraham Lincoln or anything else for that matter? Well, I should mention a couple of things. There is a website associated with the exhibition. And um, you can get to that. I see it coming up on the screen now. Um, so that if you wanted another chance to see all of the objects in the exhibition uh, and a little bit more information about them, please go to that. And that's uh, listed in the virtual uh, exhibit hall area as well. So, right. Um, I see you also have a copy of the cover of the catalog for the exhibition. Yes, this that's is my personal copy of the catalog. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is available again for people who can't come to Washington. But there's nothing like seeing the real thing. So if you can, if you have the opportunity, the exhibition will be up for two years, um, to come down and and see these really remarkable objects about a really amazing and an extraordinary individual that shapes our lives in lots of different ways. Thank you. Um, let me also remind people, if you haven't already checked out the virtual e exhibit hall area, um, the team at the National Museum of American History, in addition to the virtual exhibit, has uh, all of the objects that we looked at together with Harry today in a large format printable uh, image gallery. And there are also some great quotes from Abraham Lincoln, which are a really great point for all of you to discuss with your friends, colleagues, students, and others. So feel free to check out that image gallery. Um, and you can see uh, there's a good example of Lincoln's suit that we talked about today. Um, I should also mention, just on a logistical note, that uh, by this evening you'll have all of the recordings from today posted. So if you missed anything or need to miss anything, we hope you'll check out the recordings. Please join me in thanking Harry Rubenstein for bringing Abraham Lincoln into our lives today through the objects that were part of his everyday life. Thank you, Harry. Oh, and thank you. I enjoyed it. <laughs>